a burning flame Praise awaits you at the dawn When the world comes alive Praise awaits you in the darkness Shines in the light Praise awaits you in the soul worship this morning.
When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise
I want to personally welcome you here this morning to the Lynchwood Church of God, and I want to share with you just a few things that I want everybody here to be aware of this morning. If you are a guest or visiting us for the first time, I want to invite you to our Welcome Center in the church foyer. We have a small gift we would like to give you, as well as provide any additional information about our church community that may be of help to you. The communication cards are located in the pews in front of you. Please keep us posted on your most up-to-date contact information. And if you're not receiving email updates from the office, be sure to check the box on the front of your card. On the back, we want to invite you to share prayer requests so that we can partner with you in prayer. These requests are prayed for weekly by the church staff. If you check the prayer ministry box, know that others in the church will be praying for you as well. And of course, be sure to check the confidential box for any private concerns you have. You can turn in your communication card at the Welcome Center or use the contribution boxes which are located in the church hallway. If you're interested in supporting Lynchwood financially, this is also where you can give by cash or by check. If you prefer to give electronically, please visit lynchwood.org, go to the side tab, and click the contribution link. Finally, we want you to know that we have a staffed nursery as well as a nursing area available for infants and small children. For children ages 4 to 11, you're going to be dismissed partway through the service for Children's Church. Parents, if you have a child that is going to participate in Children's Church, please make sure you sign them in each Sunday at the child check-in station, which is located at the nursery. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning, and now we want to inform you of just a few more things that are currently happening in our church community. Good morning, Lynchwood. How are you? Um, we have some things that, as Pastor Brian's video said, that we want to highlight with you, things that are coming up shortly. Live Nativity, 20 days. Seems like a long time, but 20 days away is all. So please sign up today. There was, As you came into the um, church, you probably saw a table, Barb Richardson there. Uh, you can sign up for cast members, for crew, for food donations. And we appreciate it. It takes, it takes a church to make a live nativity happen. And if you've never participated, you will be blessed. I promise you. I've been, been a part of about 31 of them. And I can promise you every one of them is unique and every one of them is a blessing. Uh, the details and sign, uh, from the sign-ups, like when you're going to be here and you know what shift and, and what cast member you're going to be or if you're going to be on security and uh, whatever safety, that will be available next Sunday, the 28th. So it's really important to get you signed up today. And don't forget that many hands are also needed that morning. That's a Navy term. All hands on deck, many hands. That's, I like that. I didn't even write that. That was Jackie. But many hands are, uh, are needed to get all the sets built and in place on Saturday the 11th. And that, that uh, evolution begins at 8 in the morning. Also, you may have received one as you, as you came in this morning, but there's a double-sided card. These are great for posting at your work, given to family and friends, and inviting them not only to the live nativity, which is this part of the card, but also to the greatest gift, which is a musical and drama that we'll be holding on Sunday evening, December 19th at 6.30 p.m. So it's, it's like a twofer. And when the, when the live nativity is over, you flip it over to the other side, and you got the details for the next weekend. And also, um, next Sunday after the service at 2 p.m., there'll be a memorial for Richard Moore. That's Brett Moore's father, Christy Moore's father-in-law, a wonderful man of God. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be celebrating his life at 2 p.m. next Sunday. And also coming up, you older kids, on the 4th of December, which is the Saturday before, that's only 13 days away, the Saturday before, the live nativity anyone that's 55 and better catch that 55 and better again that's that that was jackie again that's not me we'll be going to the singing christmas tree uh, matinee performance on that saturday limited tickets are available there's only 40 tickets available so sign up is required at the wc the welcome center right back the main aisle there i can see the litters on the wall lastly all women are invited to the Hearts and Friendship Christmas Party on Thursday, December 9th at 6.30 p.m. I'm not going to do the math on that one, but that's less than 20 days away as well. The, the December newsletter will give you details about what to bring for that. So those are the announcements for today. Live Nativity, the memorial service, the OKs going to listen to Jim and Becky Jolly at the Singing Christmas Tree. Just throw, throw a little 
promo in for that. And lastly, ladies, hearts and friendship, you've got a party. Tis the season, right? So I'd ask you, as we transition from, from uh, announcements into worship, if you would uh, rem uh, focus with me on, on, on the question that's before us, is my heart right? Am I prepared to worship? Father, it's a privilege to come into your house this morning. It's an inspiration to me to see these brothers and sisters and these seekers, people that want to know more about Jesus, people that want to live their life for you. Lord, we ask that you would prepare our hearts for worship, prepare our hearts for the word that Pastor Brian has for us. In all things, we give thanks to you, and thank you for the wonderful gift of your son, Jesus. Our eternal hope is in Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Please stand as we join in worship. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain.
thankful for. If you haven't got your hand up, you better. God is good. God is good all the time, all the time. You know, uh, COVID has presented a lot of challenges, amen, <laughs> to say the least. And last Sunday, we were the first Sunday, we broke the 200 barrier, amen. Let's celebrate. Right, Pastor Brian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's not the only thing you missed. You missed that animal you were looking for. <laughs> yeah, but the animal's thankful. Amen. Take your list, if you would, this morning. And uh, just take a few moments. I know some of the people you know and some of you don't know. Cheryl finally had her knee surgery, her kneecap surgery. And she is recovering at home, and uh, we pray for her. But just scan down the list of people. These, these are people that God loves, people that God cares about. And as we pray for each other, it just blesses God's heart when we think of one another. Barb Chappelle will have her surgery on Tuesday, and we're thankful for that. I know Barb's here this morning, so we thank the Lord. Would you stand with me, please? As we go to the Lord in prayer, please feel free to use the altars. And if during prayer, if you want to be seated, that's fine too. It's, it's the attitude of the heart, not the position of the body. And again, as we did last Sunday, just thank the Lord for what he's done for you, for salvation, for friends, for family, for provisions, for job, whatever it is. Let's just spend a few moments and say thank you, Lord, for these things that have come to us. Father, I have so much to be thankful for. As each one in this room today, for your goodness, for your love, for the plan of salvation, for my family, for my church family, for healing, for food on my table, for transportation. And I know a lot of people are struggling in various areas, and maybe even this day it's a little bit difficult to give thanks because of where they are. But I pray that, Father, we'd look to you. You're the beginning, the end, the first, the last. You promised to supply all of our needs. You promised you'd never leave us or forsake us. Lord, may we, in the midst of our sadness and sorrow look to you the one who can provide for everything we pray for these people this morning that are recovering from surgery that are going to surgery uh, that have covid that uh, are facing various situations that have lost loved ones lord there there are so many things we can bring to you and we're so thankful that you never tire of hearing our request, and yes, you never tire of hearing of our gratitude and our thanksgiving. We're thankful for the church. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to continue to grow and reach and, and make a difference in this community. There's so many ways we can touch lives. And Lord, I, I pray for those people that are being nominated for various positions in the church because it's so important that we fill these positions. And Lord, we do ministry in these various areas. Again, Father, we love you, we praise you, and may we, especially around the table this Thanksgiving, give thanks and praise and gratitude for all you've done for us. And yes, we would pray for Pastor Brian as he comes, and as I've shared many times, give us ears to hear, but not only ears to hear, but a willingness to do your will. For we ask it in Jesus' powerful, precious, healing name. Amen. 
Amen. Would you sing with me? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Right, kiddos you are dismissed good morning happy Thanksgiving always appreciate our prayer time in the church uh, I think one of the things that marks this church is we have learned and are learning to pray just thinking you know the beauty of prayer, prayer is one of those things, unfortunately, in the church, a lot of times we say we'll be doing more than we are doing. And I just want to remind you of two things that <clears throat> when I say to them, I think a light bulb will go off into your head and you'll go, oh my goodness, that's true. The Lord would never ask us, two things, the Lord would never ask us to pray for something that he didn't want us to have. All right? And he would never ask us to pray for something that we didn't need to pray for to get. Prayer matters. Prayer matters. And regardless of what season you're in in life, uh, I want to invite you because there's a Father in heaven who is listening carefully for your voice. Grab your Bibles this morning. <clears throat> Turn with me to Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 12. As you're turning there, I will give you an update. Um, don't worry, elk are always safe when I'm in the woods. <clears throat> we saw 38 elk. 37 of them were on the other side of a thousand foot deep canyon with an uncrossable river at the bottom of it. And yes, I know firsthand it's an uncrossable river. Uh, and the 38th one happened to cross in the road as we were driving back after dark because they mock us like that. That's how they are. Uh, managed to walk 60 miles, though. Lost a couple pounds. Good deal. Luke chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 32. Do not be afraid, my little flock, 
For your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come, we ask that you would teach us something that wouldn't puff up our knowledge, but would strengthen our resolve, would shape our heart, would shape our lives, and bear fruit in this world. We come here today to give only so that, to receive only so that we can give for that which we share. Open our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Martin, thank you for sharing last week. I haven't heard a single bad report, so, except for the emails, I haven't caught up on all those yet, no. Uh, but much appreciated, thank you for sharing, and you know, uh, I actually asked Martin, I said, I, would you be willing to share on this passage? And I kind of wanted to stay in series because I thought, man, we're going to be able to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount, right going into Advent. You're, Lou's already shaking his head at me. And, uh, and that was actually my plan. And so what you'll notice is that on your notes sheet today, you have the wrong title. Because on Thursday when we printed it off, that was the title. And in fact, there's a sermon on my counter printed off yesterday with that title on it. But that's not the one I have with me today. And so I want you to just take that, the tell of deceit. As I was just wrestling with it uh, just yesterday, the Lord just kept putting on my heart that it's, it's not right. This isn't the message for this week. And there's a couple paragraphs there that Jesus talks about the warning of false prophets and being deceived by others. And the very next one, he says, you know, not all that say to me, Lord, Lord, are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And people who have deceived themselves into believing that they have eternal life. And there's this whole can of worms that Jesus opens up on deception. And he just said, Brian, with all that's going on in the world, we need to spend some time in deception. Don't rush through it. And so we are going to come back to this after Christmas. So everybody say, yay, we're going to talk about lies after Christmas. Uh, <clears throat> but as I, yesterday morning, actually, I was finishing my sermon as I was hearing the, the 10 lepers, the 10 lepers, the 10 lepers. I'm like, but this one's almost done. I almost got it. And so um, I just want to reflect on some different words of Christ this morning. And I would ask you to turn over to a story some of you are familiar with. And in fact, in probably thousands of churches across our country, this passage is going to be taught on this morning. And I don't know the word that the Lord gave to the other ministers, but I can tell you what he's laid on my heart this morning. So Luke chapter 17. We're going to start on verse 11. <clears throat> Well, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and he passed between Samaria and Galilee. He entered the village, and ten leprous men stood at a distance and met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw what, that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at, his, at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? No one found who... Re was no one found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go, for your faith has made you well. I am in the springtime. The summer gets a little bit more frustrating, and I have a whole lot more energy in the spring, but I'm a lawn guy. I like my lawn. I have a fairly big lawn. Um, but there are two things that plague my lawn, and the first one is obviously weeds. Anybody got weeds in their yard? I have weeds in my yard because I have a lawn, and my neighbors have fields. Doesn't help. But weeds aren't 
that big of a deal. They're pretty easy to, they're, they're much easier to take care of than the other problem. My other problem is mushrooms. Mushrooms drive me nuts. They, you know, and it's either one or the other. Either I have a mushroom problem or I have a weed problem. There's never this happy medium of like green. And mushrooms, they just, it's amazing. They just shoot up overnight. You, I've spent a lot of times when my yard is, is wet, right? And it's the early season and it's dark out, whatever. Like I will spend 20 minutes with a bucket picking the mushrooms before I even get to mow my yard because then you mow it and the spurs go out and they get worse and just mushroom after mushroom. By the way, just as a side note, I think this is a testimony this morning that I was supposed to share about mushrooms springing up overnight. You know what happened to me this morning? True story. I got out of the shower and I looked in the mirror. I don't know how a nose hair can grow that long in a matter of a few hours, but I swear it wasn't there when I went to bed. All this... Getting old is fun. Anyway, they just shoot right out. Most of you are like, the masks are great. I haven't pulled my nose hairs in months. The deal with mushrooms is they shoot up, they, they shoot up overnight but they seem to wither just as fast as they grow. And they have a very specific climate in which they can grow. They like it dark, they like it wet, they like it cool, decomposing material. One of the reasons I have such a problem with them is because I put a bunch of compost in my yard before I planted it. But they grow fast, they grow big, and they multiply like crazy, but again, they have this very limited environment, this very limited climate in which they can actually grow and thrive. And the reason is, is because they're rootless. Have you ever pulled, them, have you ever pulled one out? They have just these little itty-bitty spores on the bottom of them. You can pull the whole thing out just like that. They have no root, and so all the nutrients that they need, everything they need to live is just right there, easily accessible at the surface. And the interesting thing about the mushroom is that it can endure the rain, it can endure the cool, but it can't endure the sunshine. It doesn't endure the beauty, the weather we actually want to be out in. This morning, I'm going to coin a phrase for you. It's a Brian phrase. It's about 18 hours old. <laughs> mushroom faith. Mushroom faith. It's a faith that thrives in the rain, but vanishes in the sun. You with me? It's this faith that in the midst of turmoil, it can suddenly spring to life and grow rapidly. In the midst of suffering, it just bursts forth at a moment's notice. When it's faced with hardship, it just grows and it blossoms and it seemingly shoots up overnight, but it's also a faith that when the night passes and the sun comes up and the storm clouds go and the rain passes and the darkness gives way to light, because it has no root, it quickly fades just as quickly as it rose up. You know what I'm talking about? The mushroom faith. It's a rootless faith that can only survive in the rain, and it can only thrive in darkness. We read this story this morning. You know, Jesus is on his way up to Jerusalem, and we all know what he was going up to Jerusalem for, his final journey up the hill. And as he's on his way, it says he's between Galilee, where he performed a, a big majority of his ministries in Galilee, and he's between Samaria, he's kind of on these outskirts. He's not really in a place that he's spent much time, but we see that Jesus is known, his reputation goes before him, more with word of testimony than by actual encounter. And here's 10 men that recognize him, again, probably not because they've seen him, but because someone probably came in advance and said, he's coming, he's coming, and everywhere Jesus went, I'm sure he had his entourage. We know of the 12 that were with him, but I guarantee you the group that was with Jesus was much more noticeable than a few men. And what it tells us is that <clears throat> these men were lepers. They were diagnosed with the skin conditions that made them the outcasts of society, and they understood social distancing back in that day. 
And what they would do is they would put them on the outside of the village, and they were, bar- they were barred, they were banned. They couldn't go home. They were forced to separate from their families. They couldn't go to the market. They couldn't go to the synagogue. Their trade, their work was all dried up. Uh, their lives as they knew it, all that they once loved in a moment was gone. And to make it worse, some of the superstition around the religion in that time was that leprosy was seen as God's judgment for a hidden sin. Remember the story of Job where all these things begin to befall upon Job and his friends are like, confess, Job, confess. You must have done something to make God angry. He's like, I don't know what it was. And they were all convinced that they were right and he was wrong because God must be judging you for something. And this was the perspective of leprosy. And so rather than when our friends get a tragic or a hard diagnosis, we surround them with compassion and love. A lot of times this was barred with this, oh man, who are you really? You see, God is, God is revealing to us the hidden nature of your heart. God is showing us what's really going on with you. And so not only were they cast on the outside of the, of the town, but they were also, in a, in a large degree, excommunicated. They were shunned. They were looked down upon. They were falsely judged. And if you ever want to talk about a storm of life, if you ever want to talk about a dark time in the cool of the, of the evening when the mushroom would grow and the climate was just right, this is it. Everything ripped away from them. But as I look at these guys, I see that it's in this season, when it doesn't seem like anything would really grow, things are actually growing. And I just want to take a few moments as we look at these men, and and we'll do a little bit of speculation, but I think it's there when we look at it, is to just ask, what was this season of their life producing in them? What kind of fruit was it yielding? For one, let's, let's talk about this. There's 10 men there, and later on in the passage, Jesus says that the one that returned is a Samaritan, okay, obviously indicating, and we know by geographical area, that they're between Galilee and they're between Samaria. There's probably Samaritans there. There was Jews there, maybe even some Gentiles there, and so Jesus says the one that returned is actually the foreigner, and so what do you have? You have these 10 people who have formed a little community together of Jews, of Samaritans, maybe Gentiles. People that have been trained their whole life, no, not with you, no, not with you. Don't be around me. But something in the tragedy of their situation forced them to overcome these smaller details of life, these smaller things that separate them, these superficial differences and disagreements. Suddenly they faded away in the light of something that was far more important and suddenly in the light of something that mattered far more. Is it true that sometimes, now sometimes crisis divide us, I get that, but isn't it true sometimes in our life that crisis can unite us? Because we, we really begin to wrestle with what really matters and those little things begin to fade away. I wonder what those first conversations were like when the Jew sat next to the Samaritan and he realizes he's got nobody else to talk to. Because these are people that are really... I mean, they're at the mercy of people that provide for them, and the only people they're going to get to associate with is other lepers. They're allowed to associate with one another, but they're not allowed to associate, at least in any close proximity, to others within the community. And You're sitting next to a man that you've been trained to hate your whole life, and you're hearing the accusations against you, which you know aren't true, and suddenly you realize, all these people are judging me wrong. I wonder... I wonder if, you, if I judge that guy wrong. So, uh, I'm Brian. <laughs> I don't think a Jew said that. No, it happened. That name. And just breaking in and beginning to recognize, here we are, two men, four men, six men, all stuck in the same lot of life. And our brokenness, maybe we have more in common than we thought. There's something about crisis that helps us find unity in putting aside things that should not divide us and uniting us over things that should unite us. So in the midst of the darkness, 
and the rain and the storm, we see fruit coming from these men. I also see these men show astounding faith and bold faith because they're standing on the outside of the town and it says they're yelling, they're screaming to Jesus, have mercy on us, Jesus, have mercy on us. They've heard, in a situation that is completely hopeless, they've heard of this man named Jesus and they have no bashfulness. They're not concerned about who's going to rebuke them or who's going to silence them or who's going to tell them they're unworthy for Jesus to come over there or tell them that they're somehow the fool. All 10 of them begin to shout to Jesus in this burst of energy, this burst of hope that maybe there's hope for me yet. I found a hope that I did not have yesterday. I think sometimes when we hit our bottom, there's hope the Spirit of God gives us that gives us a burst of hope from something that we never thought we'd find hope in, other, in, in, in any other way. We come to the place in which we've reached complete rock bottom, and we find that Jesus is there. And these men really had this, for better lack, lack of better words, this come to Jesus moment, where a lot of the things we do, we're really concerned about our image, we're really concerned about what people will think, we're resp- concerned about how people are going to respond to us, like, oh man, I'm raising my hands in worship, what a, what a sign of faith, man, I, I'm bold, I'm big, you know, these little things that just don't really matter, and here are these guys with just this kind of this reckless abandon, like, that guy's my hope, that guy's my hope, how, you, we sit with people and they talk and they share our stories and I'm like, is now the time to share Jesus is my hope? I don't know. And it's like, they're just all in. They're just, that guy's, he's right there and I don't care who knows it. I'm one of those crazy people that says Jesus is my hope and I don't care who hears me or who rebukes me about it. That guy's the one I need to get to. Something in the brokenness of life and the darkness and the wet and the rain and the storm that leads us to a place where we can draw those nutrients to have a bold faith. And there is something in us that gives us boldness in the midst of our tragedies and our suffering and our hardship and our disease, and especially amidst death and loss. One more I'll point out, and I'm sure it's not the least one, but I'll, you know, preach in, preach in threes here. But we see these men practice unbelievable obedience. Now, Jesus tells them, I want you to go show yourselves to the priests. And we kind of read over this as, yeah, sure, go show yourself to the priests. But this is a really big deal. And the way that their system worked, some of you may be aware of this, but the priests were almost the doctors, but they're more like, not really doctors, they're more like building inspectors. They just tell you what's wrong. They don't actually fix anything. And so you would go and you would show them whatever rash or ailment you had, and they would either say, well, um, that looks gross. Come back in two weeks. We'll look at it again, see if it's better or not. Uh, Or, no, you're fine. That's not a big deal. Or they would look at it, and they would step back, and they would say, unclean. Unclean. And that word, that word, some of you guys saw, I don't know if you saw the reaction in the courtroom this last week when the not guilty plea was was heard of this 17-year-old kid collapse. Because his whole life was hanging on one or two words. And when you're before the priests, your whole life is hanging on clean or unclean. Everything. Everything. What are they going to say? And you want to talk about PTSD. You want to talk about a moment that they had relived again and again and again. It was standing before those men when they stood back. They said, unclean, and your life is over. And you're sending them right back to the very men that cast them out to relive the worst day of their life over again. Because when they left, they had not yet been healed. Jesus said, go show yourself. And they had to begin this journey back to the place that wrecked their life, and the people that cast them out, subjecting themselves to further disgrace, further humiliation, further rejection, and being mocked. What if they got back to the priest and they were still sick? But again, there's something in the rain, in the storm, in the dark seasons of life that we just don't care anymore. (laughs) You got nothing to lose. 
There's nothing left for me to lose. Every, everything has been wiped, and we wouldn't think that anything could grow in such a season, but it, it does. How desperate do we have to be to have reckless abandon and obedience? Boy, I tell you what. I think a lot of times our dignity matters a lot more to us than our healing. And I think our comfort matters a lot more to us than our effectiveness. And I think our approval of men oftentimes matters more to us than our approval of God. And yet these guys, they were just able to leave it behind. Because they didn't care anymore what anybody else thought because everything was writing. And if, these, if Jesus would have said, stand on your head for 12 minutes in the public square, they'd have been like, I'll beat you there. And then when someone said, why are you standing on your head? He'd say, because Jesus told me to do it. And we're like, oh man, ooh, freaky religious people, right? And I'm not saying Jesus is telling you to stand on your head, but I'm saying sometimes the Lord calls us to do things that are really uncomfortable and we're far more worried about what other people are going to say or how we're going to be perceived or whether we're going to keep our dignity than whether we're going to be obedient. And these men, the situation that they had been thrust into, their dignity didn't matter anymore. What mattered was their reckless obedience to what God had called them to do and what Jesus said to do. And so we, we see in these men during this dark season, it is producing a fruit one that many of us can probably identify with and the sufferings of life. And then verse 14 says, When Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. This story reminds me of a story that I've told you multiple times and I'm going to tell you very briefly again because I love it. It's the story of Naaman. You can read about it in 2 Kings 4, I believe. He is the mighty commander of the Assyrian army, and he comes down with leprosy. And in getting leprosy, he had raided a village in which he had taken an Israelite young woman into his custody, and he had made her his servant, his slave. And when he comes down with leprosy, this this little girl (laughs) who's a servant says, you know, in Israel... You know that place that you plundered and pillaged? There's a prophet who can heal you. And and I just want you to think about this for a minute. This man who is the commander of the Assyrian army goes to his king and says, so I got this girl that I kidnapped that serves my wife and she told me that I should go to our enemies and find this prophet because he can heal me. What do you think? Can I go? The commander of the Assyrian army is taking advice from a servant that he captured as a slave. You think crisis of life tend to bring balance? To bring unity where there isn't unity? To, to, to bring faith? He had the faith to take off after this. And he actually, the first place he went was the king of Israel. Like, you got a lot of courage, man, showing up and like, hey, can you heal me? I know that I just, you know, raid your villages that are close to my property, but hey, <laughs> be nice if you could send me to this guy. Anyway, he ends up finding Elisha. Elisha figures out he's in town. Elisha calls him over. Elisha doesn't even talk to him. You know, Elisha sends a servant, and he says, Master Elisha says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times, and you'll be cleansed. And so you know, he, he kind of has this humbling and this unity moment. He, he has this faith burst moment. And then when he's told to dip in the Jordan River seven times, when he's asked to be obedient, he's like, no, I'm too good for that. And he kind of stands back from it. He's like, there's better rivers of where I'm from than there are here. This is humiliating. I can't do it. And one of his servants talks to him and talks him into going down to the Jordan River. Just humble yourself and go dip. And I've always wondered, did he get healed the first dip? And he's like, well, you better do the other six just for good measure. It's like the antibiotics, like you're better on the third day and you've got to take the rest of them. <laughs> or was he a few dips in, a few washes in before things were starting to get better? Or did he have to make it all the way to the seventh one before he was cleansed? I wonder what it was like for these men. 
I wonder if it was 100 yards later, 200 yards later. I wonder if they were in town. What if they had to put their foot on the step to get in to see the priest before they were cleansed? What a step of faith. It's like the Israelites when they, when they crossed the Jordan River. It says it wasn't until they were in the water. There's some Jewish traditions, um, writings that talk about when, the, when, the, when they had come out of, out of Egypt and they were pressed up against the Red Sea and the army was over here that they were so pressed in and so nervous that you guys know, like if you've been to a concert, crowds move that the people that were closest to the water were getting pushed in because the people on the front lines were so terrified that they were pushing back. And it wasn't until the water was up here that the Moses began to split the water. Now, that's not scripture, but that's Jewish tradition. That there's this, this step of faith. And sometimes, I gotta tell you this, sometimes the Lord heals us in a word, but sometimes he heals us in a command. I heard a wonderful testimony just a couple weeks ago about a man whose life is being restored, but he wasn't being restored at a word. It's being restored over years as he gives his marriage to the Lord, as he gives his fatherhood to the Lord, as he gives his work to the Lord. As God begins to call them on this journey, he's finding as he's going along in the journey, he's healed. And so often we don't get our healing because we want a word from the Lord. We want him to fix it now. But he's given us a command that we must walk in. And until we begin to walk in it, we're not going to begin to experience what he's spoken of. And so here are these men, and they are battered by the storm. They're in the darkness. But yet it's producing some kind of fruit in their life because we see this interesting unity come. We're seeing this bold, shameless faith and this courageous obedience, and they're healed on their way. In verse 15, it says, now one of them, one of them, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at the feet, at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. And this man was a Samaritan. Can't help but wonder why the other nine didn't return. I mean, we always have an excuse, don't we? There's always a reason for it. You know, maybe they wanted to go see their family first. Priorities, priorities. Maybe there was other people that they wanted to tell. Maybe they just needed to go to their favorite restaurant that they've been craving for so long, or just to walk through the marketplace, just to see the look on people's faces as you walk by and you're waving, like, yeah, it's me, I'm good. You know, I wonder if there were some of them in the room or some of them in the group that they wanted Jesus to heal them not so that they could return to Jesus, but so that they could return back to their former way of life. Isn't that true sometimes? How many people say with, with the COVID stuff, I just want to go back to normal. I don't want to be healed to something different. I want to be healed to the same. Jesus, will you come in and take care of this so that I can just go back to life as normal? I wonder if, if any of them were just relieved to go back to life as normal. Maybe they assumed Jesus didn't care. Maybe they told themselves, I'll do it later. Or maybe someone interrupted them along the way and distracted them. But nine had their reasons, and Jesus did notice. And for nine of them, this blessing that Jesus gave them, it freed them. It freed them from the darkness. It freed them from the storm. But for one of them, this blessing compelled him. It compelled him back to the feet of Jesus. Verse 16. It says, And he fell on, his, he fell on the feet, he fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered and said, Were not ten cleansed? But these nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, Stand up and go, for your faith has made you well. You know, I hope I'm not overreading in the story here when I say this. Is, and here's what, I, here's what I see happening. Is that the storm produced 
The darkness produced a fruit in their life, no doubt about it. It produced a unity, it produced a faith, it produced an obedience. But for nine of these men, it produced a fruit that had no root. And when the storm passed and the sun came out and the darkness gave way to light, it revealed it was a mushroom. And it withered as quickly as it had come. See, they had a faith that thrived in one climate. It was the climate of suffering. It was the climate of desperation. It was the climate of need. And as soon as the climate changed, so did the strength and the resolve of their faith. One of the things that we have to recognize as the followers of Jesus is that there are two kinds of tests. Well, there's many kinds of tests, but there's two kinds of tests, and we often don't think of it or categorize it in this way. But we all recognize that when we say, well, I'm being tested, what are we referring to? We're referring to these hard, difficult things that come into our life. It's those trials and the suffering and unpredictability that we associate with testing because we have to, we have to prove that our faith is true, that God is genuine when life doesn't work out the way that we think it should work out, when it's difficult to believe because our circumstances seem contrary to the nature of God. And we call these challenging and testing seasons. But hear me, church, listen to this. If indeed, if indeed we say that our faith is being tested when it's hard to be faithful, do we not then also have to acknowledge that just as we have a test of suffering, of darkness, of curse, there's also a test of blessing and a test of abundance that we can fail, if not just as easy, even easier. How many of you have said or had times in your life where things have gone well, the sun has come out, the darkness has passed, the clouds are gone, and then a few months rolls by and you go, man, I just don't feel as connected to the Lord as I once did. And it was actually the storm clouds passing, the climate changes, and you've actually found it's harder to be faithful in the good times than it is in the bad times. And we go, that's bizarre, but we don't think of it as a test, do we? We don't think of it as the test of blessing or the test of abundance. See, I believe with all my heart that God wants to bless us. We just read at the beginning that the Father desires to give us the kingdom. But what we fail to realize is that the test of abundance, the test of plenty, the test of peace is oftentimes harder to endure and remain faithful than the test of despair. I want to read a passage for you where God warns about this all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is given a pep talk. I guess that's a really bad way to say it. But he's sharing with the Israelites, as they're, as they're about ready to go into the promised land, and he gives them warning. And I want to just read this for you, just listen to it with your ears, and not see if this is exactly what God is warning through Moses in this time. That you will have, there is a test that comes through trial, but there's also a test that comes through abundance. And will we be found faithful in both? Moses says, all the commands that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the ways in which the Lord has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commands or not. So what kind of test are we talking about here? The darkness test, the rain, the storm test. And he humbled you and he let you be hungry. He fed you with manna and you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you, and understand, make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing you did not, did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell for these 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. 
Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. The seasons are about to change. A land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs, and flowing forth in valleys and hills. A land that is of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates and a land of olive oil and honey. A land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack in anything. A land whose stones are iron and out of those hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the land in which he has given you. But beware mm, that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances, his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and you are satisfied and you have built good houses and you live in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud. You will forget the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness, wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there is no water. He brought you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do good to your end. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that has given you power to make the wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers, as it is to this day. What's the Lord saying? Sin, I've taken you through a dark and stormy season. And I want the storm clouds to pass. I want the sun to shine on you. I want to honor the, the covenant that I made with Abraham because I want to be the one that blesses you. But can the faith that you've produced here endure in the sun or do we have a mushroom faith? Do we only have a faith where if those nutrients are right at the very top and we're desperate in need, we can hold on? Or do we have a faith that is growing deeper and deeper and deeper for all the seasons so that the Lord can bring out the sun? We will not lose our blessing. You know, this Thanksgiving, I think a lot of times as we talk about Thanksgiving on uh, the week leading up in church and we talk about, it doesn't matter how bad it is, you got something to give thanks for. I'm kind of just flipping that over this morning and I'm saying, it doesn't matter how good it is, you got something to give thanks for. There were nine men who as soon as their ailment led up, they withered and fell. Let us be the one who when we look at the blessings of all that the Lord has given us, we pass the test of blessing and we pass the test of abundance by continuing to stay at our master's feet and remembering from which it came. Heavenly Father, uh, it is crazy to believe or even to ponder, but the truth is, oftentimes the test of abundance is a greater, greater test to our faith than the test of poverty or the test of despair. And we confess, Lord, we are people that are, uh, we're crying out for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering. And Lord, we know that it's your will to bring us into a good land And our, Lord, I believe you're on the move. And it's to you that we turn and we cry out in hope and in faith. And Lord, as you pour out your blessings, may we not be one of the nine who are freed to return to life as usual, but who are compelled to the feet of Jesus. This year, this week, this season, 
especially for those in this room who things are somewhat smooth right now, let us not fail the test of blessing that you have given us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the Savior Lord Jesus, Jesus you over to the gym. Come grab a seat. Hang out for a little while. Don't run away. Just reflect. Pray with one another. Encourage one another. Share your story. Our link time is going to be starting in about 10 minutes. And come and grab a seat. Love you guys. Thank you for being here. Let's close. Jesus, we ask that we would be found faithful in the blessing because we know that you're a father who loves to shower good things upon his children, but who grieves when his children wander away. So teach us, Lord, to live in both and to be found faithful in all seasons. Grow our roots. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.